Today is Tuesday, December 16. I'm Joan Gremont and I'm here with Lynette Rikusen and we are very happy to be interviewing you, April. And it is part of the Roots to Boost project of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. So tell us about your life in South Africa, about when your family came originally, where, where they came from, whatever you know about it, and what can you share about their lives and early years in South Africa? Well, unlike most of the South Africans, my mom's parents were both born in London. Mm. And we come actually from Tunisia to Portugal, mm. to Brussels, to Holland, and eventually to London, mm -hmm. leaving Portugal during the Inquisition. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't know much on my grandfather's side, except my grandfather was also born in London. Mm -hmm. And this is my granny and grandpa. And on my dad, both his parents were born in London and my father was born in London. Wow. And he came to South Africa when he was like 18 months old. Consequently, actually, uh, by naturalization, I can be a British citizen as well, because my father was born in London. Um, grandpa, on, on mommy's side, uh, came to South Africa when they found gold, because, you know, he was born in 1886. And he was the kind of person that sat on the fence until he decided who he wanted to um, uh, align himself with. Mm -hmm. I, I remember so distinctly always going for like Friday night dinner and all the Yom Taven to mommy's parents, um, Miriam and Barney Levy. Um, my mother tells me, my mother had two brothers. And of course I knew Uncle Harry, uh, uh, well, and Auntie Helen and my cousins Pauline and Astor. And um, mommy tells me the story that during the Second World War there was a bell that used to ring on Granny's gate and there was a one person who would come and tell you if your son had been killed or what have you. And Mommy said they heard the bell ringing and she went onto the balcony and she saw the soldier coming up and Mommy said her hair turned snow white overnight. This was her baby and he was killed in the Second World War fighting against Rommel in the desert, in, um, in uh, where North is it? Africa. North Africa, mm -hmm. yes. And as a matter of fact, he's buried in what was then Abyssinia, mm -hmm. which is now Ethiopia, in Al Alamein, I think this was where they were fighting. So I've actually never seen, and I'm very sorry I don't have a picture of him, because I do have a picture of him. Such a handsome guy, and I'm so sorry that I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I never got to meet him. My grandparents on my father's side, as I said, we're both born in London. My Granny Rose died before I was born, so I don't know anything about her. And Grandpa Julius was, I, he just was never around, so I know nothing about him either. And he died when I was like 10 or something like that. So really, I was always with my Granny and Grandpa on my, you know, on my parents' side. It's so funny. And you'll forgive me, everybody, but I have to drink while I'm talking. Whenever we would go on vacation, we were so close. And it's such a sadness that we all got spread out all over the world. But we'd always go to Granny and Grandpa first. And Granny couldn't speak any Afrikaans. She was a cockney. She'd say, how long that was the only thing, uh, uh, meaning keep to the left. For those of you who don't know that we drive on the left-hand side of the road in South Africa. I used to go every Saturday morning, sorry for those who are religious, uh, to my granny and grandpa, and my granny loved to hear me play the piano. From the time I was six, I played the piano. And I would sit in the morning, and she would sit there, and whatever I played was just perfect, you know? And then we'd have lunch. Oh, first of all, we'd have breakfast, pickled herring on toast, which probably sounds awful to some people, but I loved it. And then I'd play the piano, and we'd have lunch, and then we'd get on the tram and go to the Piccadilly mm -hmm. and see a movie. I remember one time, don't ask me how it happened, 
I got off the tram and Granny was on the tram. And I'm running after the tram saying, my Granny is on the tram, my Granny is on the tram. <laughs> Waiting for the next stop, you know, and she got off. But we were a very, we were actually very close to, to Granny Barney and, and Miriam Levy. Grandpa was really the patriarch of the family and for some reason he didn't encourage closeness between Mommy and Uncle Harry. So we never had a close relationship with our cousins, which is so sad, because now Pauline lives in Holland, in Adam, and Astor lives in Cape Town. And I love them. They're wonderful people. But Grandpa had a way of causing problems. What can I tell you? Anything else you want to add about your own life growing up in South Africa, your schooling? Uh, what was particularly memorable? Well, the one thing I do remember is that um, Mommy wanted to enroll me in school at Fairmount, and I wasn't turning five until November the 10th, and they wouldn't take me. So I went to Orange Grove Primary School. So think about it. We started, what, on the 3rd of January or something, because we started at the beginning of the year, and I had just turned five. Five. Just turned five, and I went into first grade. So I was one year at Orange Grove. I was then went to Fairmount, uh, grade two, standard one through standard four. Then mommy and daddy built a house in um, Waverley and standard four and five were not happy years because they then... Avril, tell us a little more about your parents, what your father did, for example. Well, um, my grandfather owned a business called Home Optics mm -hmm. on the corner of Jeppe and Gold in downtown Johannesburg. And the one side of the business was wholesale hairdressing uh, um, supplies. They used to make these big vats of shampoo and hair conditioner. And then they would import in, you know, combs and cutting scissors and what have you. And um, the salesmen would go out and they would sell to the actual salons. My Uncle Harry, my, my mother's brother, was on the optical side. He was an optician. And so, you know, he ran that size, side of the business. The very unfortunate uh, factor in this business, because Grandpa owned the building, was my father went in with my grandfather, and everybody adored my father, absolutely adored him. But the problem was is that Grandpa was going to be in the Stone Age the rest of his life. When people went to electric typewriters, Grandpa still had those old-fashioned typewriters. I don't know how we typed on them. You really needed a, a lot of strength in your hand, you know, with the carbon paper and the what have you. When, when, when the, what you call it, when the electric typewriters went to the golf ball, what did they used to call them? Remember? The, it, it, IBM it had golf ball that, Select, exactly. Yeah. Grandpa stayed with everything. So he never went with the times. And he never, you know, went to computers or what have you. Consequently, when he passed away, um, my cousin, Astor, who went to take over the business, he was so far in the dark ages that it was really impossible to pull himself out of it. And it was sold for next to nothing, which was really a shame because those two businesses had supported two households all the time growing up. Mommy actually also used to work in the business, mm -hmm. you know, on, on, on her occasions. And, um, and then they sold the building. Again, I think you have to be lucky to sell at the right time because they sold at the wrong time, but so at the wrong time, I can't even begin to tell you. But then again, it's a crapshoot. It could have been way less and it could have been way more. So, so who, who was to know? And um, uh, like I said, mommy had a, had a lot to do with, with running the business as well. Um, my dad was just, I mean, everybody asked for him. They didn't want to speak to anybody. Can I speak to Mr. Harris? Mm -hmm. And you know, as sweet and kind and wonderful and loving my father was. I mean, my father never laid a hand on us. That, that wasn't in the, in the picture. Nobody laid a hand on you. You know, mommy tried on occasion and my brother ducked and 
Did I tell you I have a brother in the United States? No, you didn't tell him. My brother, Sydney, said, Chan, as I call him, how's it, Chan? Um, lives in Irvine, California. He actually followed me to Dallas. And I'm sorry, he hated it here. So, and, and he, he met somebody. First they moved to Seattle, and this is talking about luck. They bought a house in Seattle. He's always done computers, whatever he does with computers. They bought a house in Seattle, gorgeous house. When you sat in like the little breakfast nook and you looked out, you could see horses on the trail. And when he sold, I think they were there maybe a year or two, he made like five times as much because Seattle was booming. And then they went to California. Now, because he had made all this money, uh, he was able to buy into something nice in California, although I still have no idea how they live there with the taxes. And he is a semi-professional mountain biker. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he's, he's amazing. He's got two sons. My one son is, his one son, Aaron, is a genius. He's a, a senior at USC, the University of Southern California. I think he has like a 4.56 GPA, and he's doing a double major, um, um, mechanical engineering and computer science. And there's nothing you can ask Aaron that he doesn't know about.